Welcome, friends. Pour your favorite cup of tea, coffee, or cocoa, and settle in for Sips from the Sip from the Utica Institute Museum. Sips from the Sip is all about sharing the history of little-known people and places in Mississippi. We're serving up truth, justice, with a dollar for sass. I'm your host, Jean Green. Today's episode is the 22nd of a multi-part series of readings and discussions from the book, Black Man's Burden. Joining me today is Dr. Shirley Hopkins Davis. Dr. Davis, who is Dean Emeritus of Hines Community College Utica Campus, joins me to continue a discussion we began in Chapter 10. We're welcoming back Dr. Shirley Hopkins Davis, who was with us on one of our earlier sessions talking about Chapter 10. Dr. Davis, if you will recall, is a retired Utica Campus employee. She is Dean Emeritus. And I am so pleased to have her back with us down here at Utica to talk about Black Man's Burden, Chapter 11. This chapter has some really interesting components to it, and I am so tickled to hear what Dr. Davis has to share with us about the Black Belt Improvement Society. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you. This chapter, the whole club moves toward the societies. Mm. For some reason, black folk were taken with societies. They they like being part of societies. Yes, ma'am. Recently, uh, my sister-in-law, who lives in St. Louis, came home, and she was very excited because she is a member of the NCNW, which is National Council of Negro Women. Oh, okay. And 100 black women. Mm-hmm. And they are having an affair, and she's being recognized, one of the honorees, uh, some award that she's going to get for her outstanding work. Mm -hmm. And we were doing ads for her to help her. And so we received, I received a text message with a link on it. Mm -hmm. And you would not believe the number of people that they are honoring at this affair on the 28th in St. Louis men and women, they have to have made over a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Doing a book a book of ads, pictures and what have you. Out of more than fifty people being honored. Oh good goodness. Uh, and it's a society, so to speak, that she has been a participant in for the bulk of her life and my sister in law is eighty. Oh goodness. Uh, And she was just so excited. She had to find a black dress to wear and Mm -hmm. all of this type of thing. What Ose Cloud does in Chapter 11 is focus on the fact, I got to find something these people really like. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to do. Because having a desire to be a part of what we think is good is something that you psychologically to help people get to something else that's good or mm-hmm. better for their lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're saying these people like societies. They like coming together and putting their heads together and coming up with ideas, ways to raise money and mm-hmm. this type of thing. Must be something to that. So in order to further educate. Okay. And to change the behavior of humanity, of our people, Mm -hmm. our culture. He takes a look into our culture right here, what they are doing right here. Mm -hmm. I can take that and I can help them learn some other things that they need to learn. Mm -hmm. So he started the Black Belt Improvement Society. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to engage them in stages of improvement. Right. I am going to start you off if you just got, if you got anything, mm-hmm. you're going to be at level one. Just a desire. Just whatever you got. Mm-hmm. Now, the next level is if you got one cow <laughs> That's right. and a horse. The next level, each level 
as they say, every round goes higher and higher. That's right. Each level becomes more complicated. Mm -hmm. But it's a stairway to the highest level, which, what is my goal? My goal here is to get people to understand that ownership is important. That's right. What you own gives you the freedom to do some things that you otherwise cannot do mm-hmm. when somebody owns you. Right. Because you're just under their control. Uh-huh. So learn how to be in control of your life, your family. Mm-hmm. Okay. I want you I want y'all to look at how you are spending your money. I mean took one man and showed him how much do you owe down there at the store where you take up groceries. Right. Okay. Said, now, I'm going to show you something. Work with me, and I will show you how you will pay him all the money you owe him and begin to save some money for yourself. Mm-hmm. And then you can go and buy the groceries and you won't have a tab down there at the store. Right. I'm going to show you how it works. Will you trust me to show you? Uh-huh. Now, you're getting their trust, and then you're helping them to see that they can do this. Right. And so you have the proof with one person. You just take one person. Mm -hmm. We talked about how a movement starts. That's right. With one person, one example, you know, Mm -hmm. and he used that example, and that person became what? One who would testify yes. to what this man has just mm-hmm. shown him. Right. I now have $30,000. I now have this as a result of what he taught me how to do. Mm-hmm. He taught me how to be debt free. That's right. And now I am free to own some stuff. He taught him. Wow, y'all living in these little one room shacks. Right. And you don't even own them. Don't own them, and you got the bonnets. Then he mentioned something about that the, I called it disposable spending, where you know you buy spending your money on bonnets and calicos when you could save that money. Yes, he taught them, you know, how to focus on what's important. Mm-hmm. You know, those things that that we should focus on in life, how to build your family, and mm-hmm. own some land. Owning a piece of land as opposed to renting Mm -hmm. became important. Own your house. Mm -hmm. This is what Holtzclaw was trying to help our people understand Mm -hmm. with the Black Belt Improvement Society. That you need to have something. He was teaching them how to invest. Right. And that is something that is very much relevant today. Mm -hmm. You have more of our young people learning how to invest, Mm -hmm. learning how to make the money work for you. Right. Rather than you're working for the money. That's right. Okay? My nephew, who didn't didn't finish college, started but didn't finish. Mm -hmm. Marcus retired at 53 or earlier. Mm-hmm. He's still retired. What? But he owns his own house. It's paid for. He worked at the fire department for mm-hmm. years. He went to the military. and All of her children own their homes. And they, they got good jobs. Mm-hmm. More money than I ever thought about making <laughs> in a year. You know what I'm saying? I understand. I do. I understand. My that. kid, my son, and his wife. Make more money than I ever thought about making. And their whole thing is invest, invest, invest. Mm-hmm. What Holtzclaw was doing with this Black Belt Improvement Society was teaching people how to take what they have and invest it. He taught mm-hmm. them to invest in the community. Right. That's right. It's like the young man that bought this place down here. He was a student at Utica and he was in the military. 
and they, oh, and they yeah. bought this place over here on the lake. They got the lake behind it. And oh, Paul Willis. Paul Willis. Mm-hmm. So they come back home mm-hmm. and they buy into. See, he's buying the mm-hmm. land and stuff. I don't know what he's doing now, but that's the idea. They right. go away. They make money. They come back and they buy land. They invest in something mm-hmm. that will carry them through their later years That's or help their true. children. That's right. So he was teaching them how to build up to a point where they could invest, where they could be seen as impactful mm-hmm. in the community. Mm-hmm. But more than that, be seen as a person, not as an object as an object to be That's manipulated right. and controlled to be owned mm-hmm. to be owned he taught them how to gain respect because mm-hmm. he says in that chapter that you know we we got some buildings and we got some money mm-hmm. but those things alone will not make a school what i've got to continue to do is change the way we Handle the money that we get. Mm-hmm. Though it may be little. Change the way you handle the money that you get. Mm-hmm. Acquire some land. Own something in this community. This is how these people that you are being controlled by have your respect. Mm-hmm. Because they own something. They own you. That's right. And they own your money. Whatever little money you have, if you got it in the bank, Mm -hmm. they own it. Chapter 11 becomes a very significant step in the development of this book because it's moving this institution to another place. That's right. It's getting more people involved in economics. Mm -hmm. Although he's not calling it economics. It's not necessary. But it is a way... To contribute to the economic development. This used to be a booming area. In Mm -hmm. industrial times. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to the lady. Who has the history. um, Dr. Land. Dr. Land. She was recording the history. Yes she did. From the cemeteries and everything else. Exactly. Yes. And she could show you where. This was a booming industrial area. Mm Mm-hmm. And although the people who lived here, who reared their children here, the children didn't stay. No. They went other places. They went north, and they went other places. Mm -hmm. But not all of them left. Right. So there are many who still own land here because of what Holtzclaw did. He Uh taught them how to own land and own homes Mm -hmm. and raise their families and educate Mm. their families. That became important Mm -hmm. in the Utica community. And when you look at, and I think you and I tried this, we tried to go back and look at the people who had gone through Utica and Hines AHS, Mm -hmm. and we tried to lift those persons who had become political leaders, good lawyers, educators, presidents, Whatever you could think of as an important part of the societal makeup, Mm -hmm. we have some graduates who have done that. And we tried to do it when they were talking about closing Hines AHS. Mm -hmm. We tried to pull together what a significant impact that school had had on educating a group of people, a large group of people, Mm-hmm. who served throughout the United States, yep. not just in Utica, but throughout the United States. That's right. It's a proud testament to the fact that we have a person who, headed, as they say, headed up the January 6th committee. Sit, you know, mm-hmm. committee. That's right. And to hear him speak, come back on Men's Day and, and hear him speak, and he said, you know, we worked so hard to get black people in leadership position. And when I look at the city of Jackson and the leadership that we have and how they're acting like buffoons Mm -hmm. on TV, Mm -hmm. it's just heartbreaking. 
I know it is. It's just heartbreaking to see that. So the influence has come from somewhere. Mm-hmm. They, they've started to think that if they make loud noises, that things will change. But a lot of what Hold Claw did was not banging and clanging and making loud noises. It was touching the people, that's the hearts right. of the people. That's right. And that's that's what I think is important about this chapter. It's another mm-hmm. notch mm-hmm. in the in the move toward a burgeoning institution, a growing institution. Mm-hmm. That's right, Doc. I'm not sure if it's in <clears throat> this chapter, but when Holtzclaw was able to not be affiliated with any particular denomination. I don't think that's in this chapter, but still, that impressed me in that he he wanted the school to be open for everyone. Mm-hmm. He didn't want it to be called a Baptist school or a Methodist school, but he worked within the community so that he was welcome at all the churches. And that allowed him to quietly pull all these different strings and people together. When you said we talked about trust in an earlier episode, about making sure you build the trust of the people and that you show them what they need to, to, what is it? There's a saying that says you can't be it if you can't see it. And he showed them. So they knew what they were looking, you know, what success in this area looked like. He built his own home on this land that we're sitting on. And that was an example. What you say, the Pine Cottage was a multi-room cottage. That's That predates the Hoaxclaw Mansion. And so he was able to show and lead by example. And the importance of that can't be overstated. Right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. We have to be the example. Mm. And I think it was Barack Obama who said, be the change you want to see. Be the change. You know, if I can change, you can change. Mm -hmm. And so he did those things that he desired of them. Mm -hmm. He did it. You know, his family, his whole family, including his mama, went to school here. Right. And got their education here. Which is why it becomes important and it becomes a matter of discussion when you have people talk about where your children go to school mm-hmm. and that type of thing. Are they going to private school or are they going to public school? There you go. That's uh, right. Are you going to this college or are you going to that college? Mm-hmm. Where does your loyalty lie? Exactly. And that's what people use as an example of whether you are being the change you say you want to see. Right. You know, uh-huh. and often we will say when people decide to move away from what they have been accustomed to, what they have seen mm-hmm. in the communities, we say, well, they trying to be bougie, Us. you know, and that type of thing. At some point, we have begun to reckon with the fact that we have a different generation. Yes. And each generation changes. Mm-hmm. And they adopt their own set of beliefs, mm-hmm. their philosophies, even as it pertains to religion. Right. We're we're having a difficult time in our church with keeping young adults because the young adults don't see church the, the mainline church as being the way not that they don't see God in their mm-hmm. lives. It's just that they don't see that mainland church being the way for them to serve God. I got you. You know? Mm-hmm. And so what Holtzclaw did as it relates to religion is he peeped the whole card of the people in the community. <laughs> All of them had allegiance to a certain denomination mm-hmm. and pastor. That's right. And at that time, you had, in this community, Church of Christ Holiness USA. Is that the spot and wrinkle people? Is that what? (laughs) Church of Christ Holiness USA, Mm -hmm. that little church that my sister-in-law belongs to right over there on the side of the Highway 18. Mm -hmm. That was the predominant denomination in this area. 
Oh. And the person who was leading that denomination, I can't think of his name now, but he and and some Baptist preachers, mm-hmm. these were people that the people in the community trusted. Mm-hmm. So in addition to Holtz Claus trying to make himself trustworthy or to right. show himself trustworthy, mm-hmm. he gained the friendship or relationship with those people that he knew they trusted. Exactly. Okay? Yes. And he got them, as you indicated earlier when we were talking about Chapter 10, he got the whites who owned the banks Mm -hmm. and the grocery store, the department stores, Mm -hmm. to work with him. Right. To show them how he could help them to have a better community. Right. Okay. Better relationships in the community. If I teach these people certain laws, certain ways of connecting with one another or being civil, Mm -hmm. then they won't steal all your food out your stuff. Right. You know, and risk going to jail for it. And they're not going to break in your bank and rob you. They might come to your bank and ask you to lend them some money. Mm Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to teach them how to handle those loans. And I'm going to teach them how to profit from whatever they do with the little money that they make. Right. How to have crops and and to get money from the crops and use that money to develop themselves and their homes and that type of thing. And their environment. To reinvest in themselves. Reinvest in themselves and pull themselves up. Mm-hmm. That's rising above. This ignorance, because ignorance means that you don't know. That's right. And if you don't know, you're ignorant. That's right. And so I want to help you come out of the ignorance. Come lift out that of burden, you said. Lift the burden. Lift the black the burden. man's burden. Lift the burden. So his chapter 11 is moving on with lifting that burden. And what Holtzclaw realizes is that this is not going to happen in a day. That's right. In a year. In not even in 10 years. Mm-hmm. But it's going to happen. Step by step, mm-hmm. little by little, we're going to see changes. We're going to see somebody building a house over here. Somebody going to drive by and say, hmm. I remember one time there was a young man that had a church in Canton, Mississippi. Okay. And the church was on the corner where you would go into Canton and you would pass by it. It was on some land. That was before they, not Canton, Madison. Okay. That was before they made Madison what it is today. Okay. Okay. So that church, it was like a little chapel. Mm -hmm. Neat little church right in the fork of the, you had to turn right. And then you could keep going, mm-hmm. and it, it had that land right in there. Right. And then they had another church on another piece of land, and he had to pass to both churches. One was named Bennett, the other mm-hmm. one was St. Paul. Okay. So he stayed there, and he said, I used to drive by Pearl Street, and I said one day, I'm going to have a church like that. Huh. And he was there for all of, I think, 10 years. Mm -hmm. But what he did was he got those people to trust him enough to merge and become one church. Mm -hmm. And then when the city began to change the geographical landscape and to Mm -hmm. build a through highway, Mm -hmm. a mall over here, and, you know, Mayor Mm -hmm. Hawkins just was... Churning things up. Right. He sold it to the city because the city needed that land. Ah. Sold the land, sold the church. And then they went over inside of the city and built St. Paul. Okay. And that's the church that he built because he looked at, he made Pearl Street his object. And he Mm -hmm. said, one day, I'm going to have a church like that. Mm Mm-hmm. It won't be this little chapel. Now, they were supposed to take the church 
and move it to the new church and then it'd be the chapel. Oh, the but building the, itself. The building itself, yeah. They used to go there and have meetings. It was just a small, it was like a little chapel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But they didn't do that. I, uh-huh. I don't know what happened with the church and I don't know hap- what happened with the move. But he was able to look at what somebody else had done. Uh huh. Because, see, we didn't build Pearl Street, but Johnny Barber bought the church from the Baptist people mm-hmm. on that corner. So we moved from Pearl Street to Robinson Street, but we kept the name Pearl Street Church. Gosh. Yeah. Okay. That church was purchased, I think it was $3 million or something like that, mm-hmm. but the church was paid for in 10 years. Wow. And so he was looking at what someone else had done. Mm-hmm. And he did what he did. And awesome. that's what Holtzclaw was trying to teach, was that we need to have this ripple effect mm-hmm. if one does it. And that's something else that he gleaned from working with our people, from knowing our people, Okay, was that we do like to have what you have. <laughs> You keeping up with the Joneses. I got you. I got you. Doc. You know the the uh, one other thing that just occurred to me about this book. You know you, what you say: be the change you want to be. But um, sometimes when folks look at an example, they may think it's too far above them to reach for. Yeah. But Holtzclaw started with his story about being born. Eating on the floor with him and the and the dogs and the pigs. You know, you can't get no lower than that. And if he could come from where he started to where he ended up working, creating and building the school, then there is no excuse for you. Cause it's I was where you are and you can be where I am now or further. Not just for how he grew up, but what he was when he arrived here. Exactly, yes. He didn't have anything when he got here. Didn't have a thing. Yeah. But a broken bicycle. Yeah. And then he sold that for $2. Yeah. So when we tell that story to the students, they say, $2? I'm like, well, you know, $2 did buy a little bit more, but it was still $2. Mm-hmm. What could you do if all you had was a broken bicycle and $2? Would you throw your hands up and go, ain't nothing I can do? Or would you see, what is it? Every obstacle is really an opportunity for uh-huh. you to do. You know, are you going to let it remain an obstacle? Or are you going to look at that and see how that is an opportunity right. for you to do more? You think of all of the cliches that we've come up with through time mm-hmm. that all have to do with, as my favorite bishop, Bishop Henning, used to say, <laughs> succeeding while failing. Huh. I get the opportunity to try to think about, if you ask me, say, help me write a, write a message. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do what you do in journalism. I'm going to say, well, what are you thinking about writing? Right. Well, I'm thinking about doing it on this and the other. Okay, so, so give me a few little points you want to touch mm-hmm. them on. Give me that. I can write your message. Mm-hmm. I do it all the time. I've been doing it all my life. Uh-huh. Okay. I've been doing it all my life. And people ask me, how do you do that? I say, you know, I don't know. I just feel like I think I know what you're trying to say. Mm-hmm. And if you can just give me a, a little tip of what it is you're thinking and how you want it to turn out, then I'm going to develop it. I, I was doing it. Yesterday, I was doing it Friday night after I got off the phone with the bishop. And Mm -hmm. the other person that was on said, Bishop, you know, I think because we're trying to eliminate debt as well. So they've come up with all these different strategies. So we still have not eliminated the debt. But the young man said, Bishop, I wish somebody would give you $100,000. That would get that debt down. And the bishop said, by faith. Hmm. So later on that night, I went, okay, I'm going to put together this vision statement for 2024. Mm -hmm. And so it it hit me this far by faith. Mm -hmm. This far by Mm -hmm. faith. So I sent it to him and I said, I'm thinking this far by faith. I had been thinking about, you know, the year of prosperity. Mm -hmm. 
So he said, okay, that's good. And I said, I'm thinking Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom mm-hmm. and all these things. So he texted me back. He said, no, First John 4 and 4, faith is an inside job. So I looked at First John 4 and 4. Mm-hmm. And the B part of that verse is, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Uh So he's saying the faith is inside of each person. Okay. And that's the job that needs to be done. Hmm. Each person Hmm. has to have that faith inside, not just talk about it. Right. But actually have that faith indwelling Mm -hmm. in order to do it. So Holtzclaw had an indwelling faith in the people Mm -hmm. and in himself. He had to have it in himself in order to have it in the people right. that surrounded him. And he was a, a person who sought the change in humanity mm-hmm. that he dreamed about. Mm-hmm. And life is not done, what did he say, by playing on minor note. That's right. But on major, That's major right. notes, major, major keys. keys. That That was the summary of his life mm-hmm. that he... We always overlooked the things that so easily beset folk Uh and said, let's move on. And that's what the bishop was saying when he said, I wish that somebody would just give us any. He said, by faith, it's going to take time. Just have faith. And that's what we did at Pearl Street to realize this vision that's to come to pass in the next few weeks for the ribbon cutting and the opening of that facility to the tune of $28, $29 million Ooh, that mercy. we were able to get people to invest mm-hmm. into that project by faith. Who was it? I was in Atlanta, and they were talking about the, the AMEs and the CMEs were talking. And they said, the bishop, whoever the bishop was, was talking to them about how they're going to raise money. And I said they couldn't. They went to the pastors, and the pastors said, We'll pray for you. But they went to the mission sisters, and the mission sisters said, how much money do you want? We can get that. And the women set about and did it. Mm-hmm. And that made me think. It, I really thought of you because of your work with the the mission society and how when you, you get started on an idea, I remember the bolder shoulders. Oh, yeah. And, and the other other projects we had worked on together. Yeah. And the sisters get together and they say, just like Host Claw did with that teacher's extension, we're going to divide this thing and conquer. Right. And they divide right. and conquer. That is correct. Every time. So I really have been touched more than you know, probably, by the example that you have set. But thank you so much. And... We'll check you next time. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in to Sips from the Sip. Join me next time for a reading of Chapter 12 of William Holt's Law's Black Man's Burden. This program is supported by donations from our listeners. If you enjoy learning about the history of William Holt's Law, the Utica Institute, and Mississippi, consider donating. To support Sips from the Sip and all the work at the Utica Institute Museum, visit our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Utica Institute. Until next time, this has been Jean Green coming to you from the heart of the Sip.